Yeah, so I'm Benjamin. Looks like most of you have seen me before. And uh, I have a presentation titled Property Based Testing and Fault Injection for Real Time Hardware. And uh, in case we're not familiar with me before, I trained a lots of slides uh, yesterday with some work that have been presenting before to give a background. So I think I will go through those quickly. Uh, I can see here. Um, and then I will. Uh, focus a bit more on the real-time hardware thing that I think is interesting, mainly because I like hardware. But uh, yeah, we'll see. So first I will talk a bit about combining property-based testing and fault injection, and uh, quickly show a simple tool approach to doing that. I will uh, mention a quadcopter system that uh, we built and also that, uh, that I also made a simulator for. And the simulator I have been doing with uh, testing with uh, property based testing and fault <coughs> injection using QuickCheck and this tool. And uh, then I will go into real time hardware, which is essentially doing the same thing, but uh, replacing the simulator with something that has some real time requirements and you cannot run on simulated time. And um, yeah, a quick over. This is a picture I drew a long time ago with about the state machine based testing of QuickCheck. So, have, like, QuickCheck, this is the wrong side actually. Yeah, but you have a tool that generates some data, and you have a program, in, a C program in that case, and you have some kind of model, and you get some output, and you generate something from the model based on this input, and then have updated the condition and update the state and so on. I guess you're familiar with that. And uh, then I would want to add something to add fault models into that and take that into account and also update the state based on, well, maybe you don't get the same output, but given this fault, you should have some fault hand mechanism that should uh, achieve something else that is still valid. And I wrote a simple tool called FaultCheck for that, that you can link in the C program. And uh, this is the interface to your property based testing tool. And you can either use it with some probing in the program, or you can also which was the case for some other things, like you can use a communication channel and then inject, for example, communication faults. And I did both of those in this quadcopter example. I will go into them after this. So the quadcopter platform, this is something I've been working on for a project called Carrion at SP. And it is a platform with some quadcopters and some anchors for localization indoors. And uh, yeah, also a simulator that I will go into details about later. And the goal with this one was to have a platform that can be carried in a box with the quadcopters and everything quite easily and set up in less than 15 minutes in new locations. So usually when you see those videos, then you have to like uh, get good contrast and good lighting in the room, set up cameras in the ceiling and measure everything is on. And it's also quite a lot of equipment to carry. So the goal of this one was to have something that is easy to move and also not so inexpensive and also have localization indoors good enough to do uh, autonomous flight. Uh, I showed a bit about this on the midterm workshop, but I didn't have anything autonomous, so just flying it manually and talking about the simulator. And uh, it works something like this, that you have a number of quadcopters, two or three or four anchors, all of them have a synchronized clock. Those send ultrasound pulses, pulses to quadcopters. They compute the time of flight, and based on that, together with some inertial sensors, they estimate the position they have, and then they can do autonomous flights or also collision avoidance, which I have implemented in the simulator and not yet tested on the hardware because I, I cannot crash them too often because it's dangerous and expensive and <laughs> time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's actually the speed of sound. <laughs> it's there's an ultrasound, so it's uh, much slower than the speed of light. But there is a system that uh, came available this year actually called DK Wave that could do the same thing with ultra wideband radio, which is the speed of light. But uh, when we built this, I didn't know about the system, mainly because it didn't exist yet. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it came out <laughs> two years later, which is interesting. And it would be nice to have some like micro quadcopters that I can actually crash quite often without making them fail. So anyway, this is uh, like the improvised transmitter made a circuit board inside and some some wire 
crap up here and a transmitter with small transformer and also a radar transceiver and the radar is only for synchronizing the clock and uh, also made custom circuit boards with the uh, software that we brought for the quadcopters and uh, each one of them has two of those and a lot of wires and yeah and uh, it looks something like this so each circuit board has a microcontroller some inertial sensors and the communication module and some gpi io and they have canvas between two of them and one of them goes to four motors and it uses the inertial sensors to do the well attitude estimation and the other one uh, has an uh, ABC that goes to ultrasound receiver for the localization system and also has the clock synchronization and it also has a height <coughs> sensor based on ultrasound and that's all the uh, hardware there is on one and it can look something like this Let's see if I have some sound and uh, now it's flying in position hold mode based on the system and that's me and it's supposed to go back to where it's supposed to be when I disturb it a bit. So even for this fairly simple hardware, that this, well, ultrasound transmitters are inexpensive and all the custom electronics and so on, it works fairly well. And we can fly a bunch of them simultaneously. Um, let's see. And it can also auto start and auto land, which is a bit more tricky than you think because uh, sometimes the propellers don't spin up at the same rate and it can do something like this and then it has to recover. And also the state update on the localization needs some time in the beginning to estimate the drift it has. So, but it works fairly well anyway. So for this platform, I've written a simulator and uh, tried to take the localization system and the hardware and everything on the platform into account and resemble it as close as possible. So we have, uh, well, the simulation library, which has a list of quadcopters, and it also has collision detection between them, so they shouldn't collide, and it emulates some communication between them, and it also has, uh, like, the limited rate, and we can also inject faults here, and it also has some terrain, some simple walls that, can, that it also can collide to. And it also has those ultrasound anchors where they are placed. And uh, I can run it at various time steps, depending on how much resolution I need. And each quadcopter model in this one has some differential equations for the movements and also localization emulation based on this anchor table that is sent into each one of them. And it also has something that we call ITS station, Intelligent Transportation System, which is the collision avoidance main in this case. And it uses the communication to hear other quadcopters and build a local dynamic map of them, map. And it also has the train in the map because it knows this and it listens for other quadcopters and based on where they are and the position, it has a map of them. And every time it receives a new packet from any other copter, it will update its state in the map and between the package, which arrive at a much slower rate, then it updates the map. It will try to estimate where the other copters are by looking at their acceleration and speed from previous and integrate the position. And uh, I think I had all of those points in. I skipped one. Yeah, that's what I rolled over here. And then we have collision avoidance in this situation. It works by computing risk contours around all odd quad quadcopters that it sees in its local dynamic map from one of them that are ellipses essentially. And if the risk contours overlap with the own comfort zone of the quadcopter in this case, so now we're talking about what every quadcopter does from its per perspective. If it overlaps with the risk contour of some other quadcopter or several of them, it will uh, try to steer away. It will take over control from whatever is controlling it, start to steer away and give back control to whatever is controlling it. So it should essentially be able to give them random steering commands and they should not collide if everything goes well. And if it overlaps with multiple quadcopters, it will kind of compute a vector that points away from all of them to steer away from the collision. So also wrote a simple GUI to test this. And I'm going to show this setup, setup now. The CoptiSim library that I talked about before. Also a visualization tool that can plot this in 2D. And uh, also this GUI. And uh, here's a picture of it. I will also show a video, but 
here you can centrally see that and look at this one now from this one's perspective it's moving in this direction so that's why all of them are stretched in this direction and this one is also slightly moving so that's why it's a bit rotated so it's all based on relative velocity it can look something like this what and now i'm running this in real time you can also see that uh, Sometimes uh, the green area and also this one was wobbling around it because the localization hadn't stabilized yet. And uh, this is what happens when you have lots of them. And here you have many intersections and it tries to kind of do the best it can. Okay, so now that's removed this one, it's still here in this picture, but it shouldn't be here. But now we have the <laughs> CompuSim library and we have QuickShake and we have uh, the visualization tool. And uh, the tests are actually running much faster than real time. And once we find the failing test scales, it will replay it in uh, real time. It can also play it in slow motion and so on. And it can replay the one without shrinking. And it can also do some shrinking and play it with shrinking. And what it does is it uh, generates steering commands, random steering commands to all copters, a random selected copter. Or first, it randomly places them on map, a random number of them, generates random steering commands and only checks the property that they should never collide. And it also injects fault, and the fault can be like a communication um, error or ranging reflections of the anchors or a movement of one anchor that you have an offset or that you didn't place it correctly and so on. Essentially, the faults that they had in the real system. And uh, yeah, this is text disclaiming what I just said. And uh, yeah, here are some differential equations. I'm not going to into details because <laughs> I have... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but anyway, those are some of the parts in the simulator we inject faults, and if you look at them, you can represent like accelerometer misalignment in one of the equations, and air movement, and gyroscope drift, and gain errors, and some other fault models that uh, I think are quite realistic from the real platform and inject them. So yeah, here's a video of that. Actually, this one only has one fault model. I made this video before I had all those fault models. But uh, here we have uh, a bunch of them. We had a collision here. Now we're... Uh, nah, it's playing ahead of me. Let's restart there. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> okay. No, it didn't reset. Mm. Trying to attach this. Okay. So, uh, anyway, what happened was it had a bunch of quadcopters. They were flying around. We had a fault, so this one thinks it's here, and it was actually here, and that's why they collided. It did some shrinking to only have two of them left, and then it replayed the sequence. And I could also replay it to different speeds. So, yeah. That's what I had for the quadcopter platform. Maybe we can look at this one again. But why does it... I want to restart it. Is there no restart button? Uh, here. Okay. So now we have uh, four. Two of them are flying like over here and not involved. And two of them are actually involved in collision. And then it does some shrinking, removes them. Surprisingly, the collision moves from here to here somehow. And, uh, well also stops the simulation right after the collision. Otherwise, it would generate more commands that would continue the simulation. So, yeah. And what I can do in this case is that then I can take uh, uh, this test case. I can also replay it as many times as I want. I can also go and modify the code of the collision avoidance, like increasing the size of the risk contours or something else, and running the same test case again and see if it still collides. So, yeah. So out of curiosity, what's causing that collision there? W what kind of fault is it that your algorithm is not immune to? Um, well, you cannot be immune to everything. So you have to make the assumptions that, for example, that if uh, you drop some packets in the communication that you, can, that you have to make sure before runtime that you cannot drop too many packets in a certain period, or that your communication system doesn't give you too many false readings in, on average. So 
for the generated test cases, I also have some constraints on how big and how many faults I can have. Whatever I do, I can also I can just give it a lot more faults and it will collide anyway, so I cannot handle everything. Okay. So, General, yeah. This would be seen as something if you want to have a car that drives by itself, I would like to see a fault injection model on it to see how robust the entire control software is to the number of realistic bugs yeah. in, in the physical world. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find out. <laughs> so we can say that we ha we have some constraints on how the faults are generated, and then I can, with a lot of tests, show that it's most likely not going to cause a collision. But it's not a formal proof. So uh, making a formal proof is uh, I haven't done it myself, but I assume it's like much much more difficult, and I wouldn't even try. So. <laughs> But there are people working on uh, those things as well. But it sounds more difficult than doing this. So this was uh, rather easy to set up and run once you had the simulator and everything. What was causing this collision? What was it that you couldn't handle in this case, if you remember? Uh, this collision? Yeah. You can see that uh, this is actually the area. Let's see if we move it. So now it knows where it is. And uh, then, I, no, this was actually this one. But when you do the replay, then it thinks then it thinks it's here, but it actually is here, because the well, we don't know the position exactly, okay. and that caused the collision. So you can avoid this by, for example, taking this comfort zone and making it a bit bigger to accommodate for the possible. But what sort of faults were injected? Oh, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, this was just a position offset that could be generated from uh, either uh, accelerometer misalignment, so that. The quadcopter thinks it has this orientation, but it actually has this one, and then the position estimating will be a bit off, or you can have like some air movement or so. Okay. But there are many faults that can cause this kind well, of. It's just interesting to see. Uh, this, is, this is real engineering. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious about how you were shrinking the uh, command sequences, because depending on what form they take, shrinking might work very differently. For example, if you have a command that says turn left. You shrink that away, hmm. and the remainder of the flight path will be quite different. Whereas if your commands were to form move to this absolute location, then the moving one of them will just straighten out the curve, maybe. Yes, that is actually well, it's an interesting observation. So if you look at the video again, when I had all the quadcopters, the collision was actually down here, and when I shrunk out those away, the, it was actually slightly up here. And uh, there are many many different command systems that can lead to the same collision. So what it does with the shrinking is simply, it's not like commanding move from this composition to this position, it just commands accelerate, give you, it's like you have a joystick with two knobs and it, it just generates like steering commands like a normal pilot would do. And uh, what the shrinking does, it simply removes one steering command at a time or one fault injection at a time and also shrinks the argument and also it also shrinks, uh, uh, removes the generate code copies at the beginning. And it's kind of interesting to see how it does. It was also interesting that uh, once I didn't manage to reset the state entirely, and it was just a tiny little thing that I had a timer that would uh, count, like uh, for every time step, don't communicate, don't communicate, don't communicate, 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 and so on for the communication emulation. And when I didn't reset this timer, which almost generates the same test case, the shrinking would never finish because it always uh, had a slight variation and it could go on forever. But the one thing that puzzles me when you look at the original test case, in the original te test case, the two uh, copters colliding, they do not have an off reading on where they are. If you look at the safety thing and where they are, they are in the center. And they still collide. Then when you shrink it, you can see that one of them is off. So it, it seems... It actually was also off, but uh, in the video... Uh, maybe we can play it even once more. Uh, yeah, so actually before shrinking, I'm looking at this one's perspective. And this one is shrunk away. Actually, it's off now as well. But you can see that it's slightly moved down. It should have been here, but it was actually down here. But it was the big risk contour because it was seen from this one's perspective, and they did see draws the risk contour instead of the comfort zone itself. So it was actually having the same fault injected, and if I removed the fault, it wouldn't collide. 
Anyway, so now only ten, ten minutes left to what the presentation is entitled about. <laughs> 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 okay, yes, no problem. It's Thank interesting. So, uh, I think this was also maybe interesting, hopefully. So, but I think I've presented it a couple of times before, but not for everyone. Okay, so hardware. So uh, hardware has lots of details that are left out in the simulations. Even though I did uh, try to capture the most important ones, the differential equations in simulator they can be expanded to like without any limit. You can have air turbulences and lots of small details in there that are not part of the simulation because it would be too complicated and too com computationally expensive. And uh, it's also not so deterministic. And what I mean by that is uh, this small thing I did with the communication state that would not make shrinking succeed. I cannot, when I do some tests on hardware similar to this, I would, I'm sure I would not be able to reset the state to exactly what I had from the beginning. So I would also always have small variations that potentially could make the shrinking go on forever. Or maybe I would have to remove the shrinking because it doesn't make any sense. I haven't gotten to this point yet, but I'm just introducing the software subject. So, yeah. So what we want to do essentially is take this picture and replace this thing with a piece of hardware and run the rest on a computer and maybe have default injection inside some library in the hardware. And uh, an interesting piece of hardware, interesting for me at least, is something that I've been working on in my spare time for two or three years now. It is a motor controller. It's uh, a small circuit board that I designed. It's 40 by 60 millimeters in size, has four layers and there's lots of well, wires and connections and so on. And all of this is also very sensitive because they have currents of like 100 amps and very small signals close to the microcontroller. The whole project is uh, the firmware on this one without my other tools is like 7,500 lines of code and 85 files. And we have an RTOS with 12 different threads and the power level of this one is it's this big and you can output two kilowatts continuously and peak at about five kilowatts or so. And uh, I've uh, well destroyed lots of components by doing experiments. <laughs> I have all a pile of them at home. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there are many timers to be synchronized and uh, lots and lots of configuration parameters. And uh, it's all, there's also uses some tricks, for example, to measure the currents on all the motor phases. It's a three phase motor that is connected, only measures on two of them. And it doesn't measure at the motor, it measures at the low side of the bridge to make it easier in electronics. And then they have to apply some tricks to actually get good samples and synchronize them to the timer that generates the pulse width modulation. So maybe not sampling current properly. And I haven't done that always, and it can also make things fail. <laughs> so. I also made a user interface for this one with lots of tap and so on. And I can also like display real-time data. And uh, one of the projects I use this motor controller for is my electric skateboard. And uh, here's a bit more finished. This is one of them I have too. And I also have an electric bicycle now. And uh, yeah, this one has two of those motor controllers and uh, 50 volts and about six kilowatts peak. And it's also, it's not like you can ride a skateboard. My friend built one like two years ago and I tried it and was, oh, this was cool. So if I have a normal skateboard and go downhill, I cannot do that because I don't know how to stop. So I need to have the motors working to be able to brake. So I cannot have the electronics failing. <laughs> <laughs> so I've done lots of testing of that before this, even before I started with prowess. And uh, here's a video that I made. So uh, here I'm, I'm on my electric skateboard. I had a webcam connected to my computer with uh, OpenCV running and I caught cable from my laptop down to my one motor controller uh, streaming real-time data. And I took this data and overlaid it on the video and code uh, in one thread and have one thread for audio synchronization and some buffers and so on. <coughs> and also some uh, coding to store this data on the hard drive of the computer while driving. So then I could ride and plot all the data in real time. And then you can see kind of what is going on. Here you can see the battery motor current and the voltage output, power level, speed, 
And when the negative power level, <laughs> when the power is negative, then you have braking and positive is acceleration. So now you can see this is only one motor controller. So one of my earlier tests with, with lower power, but you see there are lots of things going on. It also tries to estimate how much capacity have we drawn for the battery, how much we have charged, because when you're uh, doing braking, it will use the motors and generators and feed it back into the battery. And our on your skateboard with a laptop in your ass. Exactly. <laughs> I think I reached 37. <laughs> yeah, so I was holding this one. Yeah, so I was standing on a skateboard holding this laptop with a webcam, like holding it like this. And I came down here and a remote controller in my hand. I was. <laughs> That's why it's a bit shaky. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. So if you put six kilowatts down through those motors, how much acceleration do you get? Well, it has it in theory. So when I ride, I have a power limit on it. I tried to do full acceleration, but I fell. So, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the thing is that if you go slowly, then you don't output much. But if you, for example, if you want to go up a steep, very steep hill at high speed, uh, torque times speed gives the power, and then you need a lot of power. If you look at those mopeds, for example, that have uh, 600 or 700 watts, if they go uphill, they go like 10 kilometers an hour, like they are barely making the hill. Mm -hmm. So to make steep hills, then you need uh, a bit more power, but six you kilowatts. Will take <laughs> yeah, but uh, six kilowatts, it's completely overkill. I didn't know this because I thought, well, it's a tiny motor and a tiny controller and it's probably going to overheat. And I didn't know all of this. And it turns out that this skateboard only has one motor and has about one, 1 1.8 kilowatt peak, and that's also enough. But uh, in, remember in Sarah, this hill, this is, uh, it can barely make that hill on 1.8 kilowatts because I have no gears. So I need to have high peak power in order to take steep hills without having any gearbox. So, yeah, three minutes left. So, uh, I think I mentioned those questions before. Can we do that? How to do, do, to deal with the non-deterministic things? Like you can reset the state before shrinking. And how do we synchronize everything? Because on the quadcopter simulator, I could run it with a lot of quadcopters, but just run it slower. But this one, all the tests have to keep up to the hardware because the hardware like, decides on time, not the simulation. And they can also not run it faster. So it's important to keep in sync and be able to run everything in real time and also on the low level with the microcontroller where things are running at where the timing is like a microsecond level i have to when i want to inject faults there i have to have something that synchronizes with the system and injects the fault exactly the right places and i made a test bench um i think you can see the small text there as well so i made a test bench with one motor and one, another motor they can eat both of them can run as motors or as gen generators. And I have those motor controllers that I showed. And I also have another circuit board that I designed. It has much more accurate current measurement. And it can also inject faults with those relays. It can like disconnect one of the motor windings at the time, or it can disconnect the input power. For example, if you run with any braking and you disconnect the input power, then the voltage will rise like just an instant and then have to deck this and switch everything off because if you don't then the MOSFETs will fry and they also always fail short circuit so it will short everything so if you break and it fails it will first rise up and short short everything out and the motor will then stop very abruptly and do a very hard brake so for example if I would go downhill on my electric skateboard and do braking and then my wire comes loose which has happened then first we go up, then we'll do a complete full stop of the motor, like just stopping the wheel entirely, and that's dangerous. So <laughs> it's actually better to keep rolling than to stop. And also when I do that, I have to... <laughs> because I also have another motor and then this one might still work. <laughs> but if the one of them stops, then I fall for certain. And what also happens is that this whole thing catches fire and I have to build a new one. <laughs> so. How many times did that happen? Um, I, I could have brought my bunch of fried components. <laughs> <laughs> but I also have this uh, dead electronic smell, and uh, I think I have some photos as well with like 
one of them has split into many parts and the whole circuit board is like black here. <laughs> and uh, it's also when I do it on a hobby level, it's quite expensive. Like one of those circuit boards is like 100 euros in components. So I don't want to fry too often. <laughs> but uh, Benjamin, all the testing is done by you, right? Yeah, this yeah, circuit board. <laughs> no, it's only by me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's also, I've published this motor controller design and everything on our website, so there are lots of people in the world who are using it and testing it. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, also that uh, Charles many friends have been using it for their skateboards or their robots or electric bicycles or vacuum cleaners or CNC mills. Or you can use a motor controller for anything. And uh, there are also some guys in the world who do camera stabilization and so on. And who actually sent me lots of circuit boards and all the skateboards I have, I have like three or four of them. I got them for free. People just said, well, I can send you one because you're so nice to put it out there. So it's kind of nice to see this response from the community. So lots of things are happening here. But this one I did the work, the circuit board, in the last part of Prowess. And uh, also what I've finished now, I can talk about this part. So this is the touch band that I explained, two motors, two motor controllers, this circuit board with the relays and the measurement stuff and so on. It also has a CAN bus that communicates with, no, a Europe that communicates with one, and a CAN bus to the other one. And it has to be a CAN bus because it can take some voltage variations when you do default injection. This one is connected over USB to a library that I wrote to control and communicate with all of them. And it also has a simple tool that I can use to run a UDP server using this library so I can configure it for my normal configuration tool. For example, if I want to update the software in this one, I can go via this server over the library, via this one, via the URT, via the CAN bus, and replace the firmware in this one. Otherwise, I would have to plug in the uh, programmer here and launch the development environment and so on. So this is for making it a bit convenient. So all of this is wor working, and I've started writing a wrapper, and was planning to have a quick check here with properties and uh, write them in some way that I could uh, use this one for synchronizing things in hardware. For example, that when I want to run a certain test bench that at this current I insert this fault, I would have to upload this test case to this one and uh, have this one executed and report results when it's done for synchronization. So that's the plan with this one to write something like this. But to have, uh, uh, well, most things running here, I have to write a bit more code here and I have to write this part. I was planning to have it finished for the last Prowess meeting, but I didn't have time because it turned out that it was more than I expected to make this one, make the circuit board and make all the software and connect everything and debug everything and get stuck in many places and so on. So yeah, that was my plan. <laughs> and for example, one test case could be that uh, you run the motor at a certain speed with a PAD control, speed controller the load motor, that is the one that is not under test. And then we command a current to the motor that is under a test for the motor controller that is under a test connected to the test bench. And then we sample the accurate current for a while measured by the test bench, which has those accurate current sensors. And then the test could pass if the maximum and average current are close enough to what the motor controller thinks they were because it runs current control. And uh, we could run this test at uh, different speeds and different currents. And uh, that makes a difference because if you run at high speed, then you have a higher voltage motor, uh, motor, meaning less time to sample the current since you do it in the off time. And then you get more noise on the current samples and also some offset. And then you could, for example, in theory, figure out that, well, it works in most cases, but if you run above this speed and above this current or in this region, then it doesn't work. And then you can either try to fix the motor controller, the hardware, or you can change the requirement saying that, well, if you are above this speed and you only have plus minus 20% current accuracy, or you could try to, well, fix it in some other way. Another test case could be that uh, the motor that you run, you run its speed, speed speed control again, as before. You can run a negative current for braking, and then you inject the fault to disconnect the power supply and then you sample the voltages with the circuit board. And you see, should see that, for example, if you set that, the projection against this works that it monitors the voltage on the bus all the time. And when the bus voltage increases above a certain level, it should switch everything off. And maybe something will have some delay and increase it a bit more. But 
you could uh, design the theft store that it checks samples the ma maximum voltage. This would be done by, let's see, this thing. This thing, because it also has fast ADCs and it can sample all the currents and all the voltage threads. So you say that run, run, uh, set up this test, sample voltages, inject this fault, compute the average and maximum voltage, and pass the test if it didn't uh, go above a certain value. Because if it goes above a certain value, then you're very likely to destroy the hardware if you run at higher current or have less margin, for example. So, yeah, the plan was to run tests like that. And uh, that's it from a presentation.